Uh, hi, everyone. Started, as you know, some of you who have listened, started as a personal trainer in the 90s, made a bunch of mistakes, injured a couple of my clients unintentionally, ran into NYU, did my doctorate in physical therapy so I can help people and not injure them, and basically got into the physical therapy world and worked and studied the McKenzie method. Basically, I devoted my whole career to learn what mechanical neck and back pain are. I'm sure you felt it when you get out of a chair, your back is stiff. First couple of steps, you walk, you may limp, and that limp disappears or it becomes worse, or you wake up in the morning or throughout the day, your neck all of a sudden, where in the morning you felt good, or yesterday you felt great, and now it's stuck and it radiates down. I was intrigued by it. I always thought stretching is the best thing for it. As a trainer, I always stretch clients that were in pain. I didn't know what I didn't know. Sometimes stretches can make you worse. And so after working in this field for 20 years now, I'm in Miami Beach where my office is. And during the pandemic, I got a lot of calls from people complaining of neck and back pain. And it kind of pushed me into writing my book, which OPTP is the publisher, great company to work with. And I'm excited. This basically is the summation of what I have discovered as a personal trainer who became a physical therapist and studied the McKenzie method of mechanical diagnosis and therapy. I'm also a faculty with the McKenzie Institute USA. I teach as a continuing education provider. I teach physical therapists, medical doctors, chiropractors, etc., healthcare providers, the McKenzie method. And uh, I'm here to basically answer all the questions that we didn't have a chance to answer in the previous webinar we did, which basically dealt with common mechanical aches and pains. As I just described, mechanical back, mechanical neck pain are on the rise. Look guys, for the past two years, you've been at home, right? So if you're used to going out, if you're used to social events, if you're used to being outside and you're aware of your posture when you're outside, in the past two years, I'll bet that you were less aware of it. You were sitting more at home. You were spending more time on your iPad, your phone, your laptop, slouch posture, watching TV. And, you know, we all started seeing, we meaning healthcare providers, my colleagues and I, started seeing more and more complaints of back pain, sciatica, neck pain, stiffness, common complaints that are just on the rise. And that's my goal here today is to answer your questions as to what you should do in order to prevent it, what do you need to do so you don't get to your 80s and 90s in a stuck forward posture, because this is a choice. No one has to age like this. The public is not aware that you can maintain good posture as you age. And so we'll discuss that, we'll answer your questions, and hopefully you will enjoy it. Derek, straight back to you. Perfect. All right, Dr. Yeah, thanks for creating that foundation for us. So real quick, again, uh, also, you guys, we've got um, this, this Q&A streaming on Facebook Live, and some of you are getting moved over to Zoom to watch it. So regardless of what platform you're on, if you're on Zoom, as we go through this, uh, please type in your questions in the Q&A section. If you're on Facebook, I just made a comment. Go ahead and type in your questions in the comment section there, and we'll get to them. Okay, but we do have a lot of questions left over from the webinar that we're going to visit first. So I'm going to get over to those real quick here as I click through all these screens. Um, and I guess to start, Dr. Yuev, we, um, just to create a little bit more of a, of a foundation, if you can give us a little more context as to why you were motivated to create this book. You know, I mean, it's helped already a lot of people. We've gotten a couple best-selling uh, statuses on Amazon already with it. Why this book and kind of why now? I think for me, it was about writing the wrong I've done. I wanted to... I wanted to share what I learned, unfortunately, by, by, by making a bunch of mistakes. I always thought these kinds of pains that go down the leg are muscular. I always rushed to stretch someone piriformis, buttock muscle, or hamstring. I always thought, as a trainer, that's what you do. When someone has pain, you stretch them. And, you know, when someone has pain that moves around, you know, I didn't know what to do with it. So I thought maybe it's a, it's the iliotibial band. They need to stretch, you know, roll on a foam roller. You know, there's all kinds of different geographical locations that someone can feel down the leg. 
when they have a, a what we call a derangement or a mechanical problem in the spine that can can refer down the leg and, and, and the public is confused about it. not only the public we have healthcare providers who are treating the public who are confused about it we have patients who are saying I need to replace my hip or replace my knee and often we find that the source is not the hip and not the knee even though they're showing major arthritic changes within the knee or within the hip there is a relationship to the spine and so I felt obligation especially as I worked and studied the McKenzie method and worked with Robin McKenzie, flew to New Zealand, met the man, uh, two courses with his, with, his, with his excellent faculty that I'm surrounded with. I said, I have to do something for the public to allow the public to become more educated. And especially now, post-pandemic, where so many people have sat for a prolonged period of time and neglected their body and chose the wrong form of exercises, which we're going to touch upon in a little bit, I wanted to share that with the public, and that's basically what pushed me to write the book. Uh, Derek, you're Yeah, me. sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to click through all these screens here, and I've got all these questions coming. It's okay. I'm, I'm here. Um, yeah, so thanks, Dr. Yo. That's, that's um, I, I think, you know, not only, uh, I mean, uh, great to hear your perspective on why the book was created, but it's really inspirational, and I think it's uh, very motivating for a lot of us who are also professionals in the, in the health and fitness industries to, to see people stepping up and giving people the knowledge they need. And so we appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, so diving now in, into, the, into the contents of the book, I think one of the foundational pieces of knowledge everyone needs to understand is, you know, what is mechanical pain? If we can start there because that's where, that's kind of where you start in the book is explaining what it is. So if you can help us understand what mechanical pain is and then and then we can get into some of the questions regarding alleviating that man mechanical pain, but not only alleviating it, but I think what you're big on is pre preventing it in the first place. So. All right. so mechanical pain is the most common pain you feel as an individual in your lifetime. Again, it's the days you get out of the car and all of a sudden your hip hurts or your knee hurts. And as you move, as you walk, the pain disappears. It comes and it goes. It has a lot of variability in it. Some days it's on the right back. Some days it's on the left back. Sometimes it goes down this leg. Sometimes it goes down this leg. Sometimes it's in your left upper trapezius. Sometimes it's on your right. It changes location based on certain factors that are, that are affecting the resting positions of the joint in the spine. There are certain things we do during the day as individuals that can deranged or can move out of alignment the joints within the spine and if if a nerve is involved or not even the nerve a muscle ligament we can feel all kinds of pains in the body that can come from multiple structures and but the important thing of, of mechanical pain is it responds to repeated movement when you move it often changes it either gets better or gets worse it changes location and so mechanical pain is the most common pain we feel and the, one of the best way to prevent it is, number one, to have a mechanical assessment by a trained McKenzie clinician, certified or diplomat in the mechanical diagnosis and therapy. We are a large organization in, in, in I think it's now 30 countries, close to 30 countries. Uh, we have hundreds of clinicians throughout the world trained in the method. And in the, in the assessment, you will be required or asked to move to search for what's called your directional preference what puts your spine neck back hip knee whatever it is what puts it back in place i just saw a patient an hour ago virtually bending forward he feels it in his right hamstring he drives he feels it in his right hamstring he keeps stretching the hamstring he said to me it feels good when i'm stretching the hamstring but what we discovered as I assessed him is after doing 40 repetitions of extensions in standing, in his particular case, when I asked him again to bend forward, he said to me, my hamstring pain is gone. So he was positive it was hamstring related, but what he discovered was that movement that rearranged or realigned or positioned in the right position, however you want to call it, his spine Whatever it was that gave him a sensation down the leg, it actually wasn't the hamstring. 
he probably has something related to a lower lumbar problem, and he felt it in the hamstring. He thought it was related to a muscular problem, but he realized, I'm stretching it, stretching it, stretching it. It's still not going away. And a friend of his gave him my number, and we did, you know, he couldn't travel. He's far away. And we, down here in Florida, and so we did a virtual session. And so moving him allowed to change the baseline. And so that's an important factor to remember. Often, movement is the best medicine, but not every movement is best or every stretch is best. And here is an example of a very intelligent gentleman who keeps stretching his hamstring on one side, thinking it's muscular, but he discovered it was back-related. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we just had a really good question come in, Dr. Yob, which I think um, this is one that wasn't from the webinar. It's live right now, but Adele asked, she had 12 physical therapy sessions for lower back sciatic pain no progress. She went and saw a McKenzie uh, physical therapist, and did the homework, and three days, three days later, she feels a tremendous amount of relief. So what's the difference between, you know, what you're teaching here and then what is traditionally taught, not only by physical therapists, but maybe in a lot of cases to physical therapists as they're going through college and learning how to treat patients? Great question. It's a heavy loaded question. Thank you, Adil, for your question. Um, I think the difference to me was when I started to take McKenzie courses, I realized really the one person that can help you resolve your problem is you. There really is no one. I can have the best hands in the world. I can be the best injector and inject you or surgeon or whatever it is. You need to take care of yourself. And so the beauty of MDT, mechanical diagnosis and therapy, the McKenzie method, you know, Robin wrote a best-selling book for many, many years, millions of copies have sold called Treat Your Own Back. He basically devised the method. He was a manipulative therapist, so he was always doing things to his patients until he realized most patients can do things on their own if they learn why they should do it. And the why is so important because the education, when a patient leaves my office, the education to do something on your own, to sit in a certain way, to avoid certain things. The education is really the foundation of MDT. And so, you know, in general, the body can heal itself, whether you go to a good physical therapist or you don't. But often, Adele, the injuries occur when we hang out at home. So I'll give you an example. If you're going to watch every night TV on your sofa or on your bed, and you have back pain or sciatica, and you're sitting in a C curvature for a prolonged period of time, legs on the coffee table, or in bed like so, you know, just every night, an hour in this position, and when you get up, you feel that mechanical obstruction or pain radiating into the buttock or down the leg, and as you walk around the house, it feels better, well, you basically injured yourself doing something as simple as watching television. And so the education on how to keep the spine in a certain way when you hang out is important. Furthermore, there are certain exercises that if you feel better while you're extended or standing or extending backwards, whether in lying or in standing, if you feel better doing it, you got to do it throughout the day. And so I hope, and it sounds like you chose a good therapist to take care of your problem because you're comparing it to your previous therapy level. And again, I didn't know what I didn't know until I started to take continued education courses with McKenzie to re that I realized that often the responsibility is not mine, it's the patient's responsibility. So I salute you, and I'm happy to hear that you jumped into the water and took care of your problem, realizing you can help yourself better than anyone else. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Yeah, so maybe um, we can start to get into now some other tips and strategies to help people, um, you know, one, prevent developing some of these mechanical pain conditions, and two, for those who do have existing mechanical pain, ways to help them as well. Big area that people wanted to focus on during the webinar was for um, sleep, sleeping postures. A lot of people complain that when they wake up or during the middle of the night, whenever they're lying down is when they experience symptoms. So what are some of your top kind of uh, tips or, or sleeping positions or whatever you want to kind of go into there 
with regards to sleep and, and the elimination or the prevention or, or decrease of, of back pain while sleeping? So in general, I'm, I, you know, and I said it in the, in the webinar as well. If you wake up in the morning feeling great, I don't care if you're sleeping on the chandelier. If you're waking up feeling great, I'm never going to change it. What do I believe? Uh, what works for me? I'm a, I fall asleep on my back. And I fall, and then most of the night I'm between my right and left side. I have a pillow between my knees, and I also rest my top arm on onto a cushion. There's all kinds of cushions you can find that's comfortable to rest because I don't like to close my body when I'm lying sideways. So lying supine facing the ceiling. Now, in the past, I used to recommend for patients who were lying uh, supine, lying face up, to put some kind of a bolster underneath their knees so patients will tell me when i'm sleeping like this my back doesn't hurt and that was my recommendation sleep with a pillow under your knees that puts your lower back in a posterior tilt which usually feels good now as i started to take mckenzie courses and started to dive more into it what i realized it is that if patients have back pain while they're sleeping on their back Often, and again, this is from Mackenzie's Treat Your Own Back, having a night roll, something that is wrapped around you to support your spine while you're sleeping on your back or onto your side, might be a better option. When I started to test it on my back, I actually felt better. I started to roll a towel and put it there, and so, well, you know, I feel better. So that curvature, this curvature in the lower back, the lumbar lordosis, Okay, here's your, here's your left buttock, right buttock, your belly button is here. So if you're lying down, you often need some kind of a support under your lumbar spine if you have back pain, as well as when you're lying on your side, especially ladies that have wider hips than gentlemen for childbearing purposes, you may benefit from some kind of a support if you have back pain or sciatica while you're treating that problem. Uh, but, but more importantly, is how do you hang out before you go to sleep? What are the things you are doing before literally falling asleep? A lot of people, for example, are hanging in bed, you know, resting against the headboard or, um, you know, basically not allowing their, their back to maintain the S curvature. So if you say to me, I love watching TV in bed, okay, wonderful. If you have an adjustable bed frame, you know, maintain your head against, as much as you can, against the top of the bed. Don't lie with pillows behind your neck that push your neck forward. Because again, that will take the joints of the spine over a period of time, we have ligaments that surround the joints of the spine. And eventually, if you do this every night, think about it, you're basically migrating your neck forward, which causes issues, mechanical issues in the neck. If you don't have an adjustable bed frame and you love to watch TV in bed, still try to get yourself a lumbar roll, this McKenzie lumbar roll, any lumbar roll that will sustain the S curvature of your spine and still try to have your head supported here. I would not recommend lying in bed with pillows behind the neck and watch television or read like so. This, from my clinical experience, is associated with, um, I'll show you a picture of it, that's from Mackenzie's book, Treat Your Own Neck. This kind of position that you hang out before you go to bed, whether you're reading on your phone or iPad or whatever, these are associated with mechanical issues that people often feel in the neck and they, it radiates down or towards a headache. It either radiates up or radiates down in this fashion. So the red is pain and we feel it as a result of mechanical problem in the neck as well as often it can go up in a form of a headache. So Lying on the back, to answer the question again, lying on the back, lying on the side, but try to also maintain the good alignment, the S curvature, which I'm talking about in my book, the S curvature versus the C curvature. Remember, we age into the C, so you don't want to hang out in that C curvature for too long, definitely not before bedtime. Great. And for those of you, we had a 
question or comment, come in one of the two about those McKenzie books. Yeah, you can find those on OPTP's website. Just search for Treat Your Own and there's a bunch of in the Treat Your Own series. So check those out. Another question that we had, Dr. Yov, about just kind of day-to-day um, -day preventative strategies um, was regarding how someone working at a desk can set themselves up for success. So one person or a bunch of people specifically asked, how should my workstation be set up so that I'm setting myself up for maintaining my posture throughout the day and, and preventing back pain? And then two, you know, how often do you recommend breaking that position throughout the day and engaging in uh, movement? And then I'm gonna lo really load you up here. Three, what movements do you recommend people um, break the day up with. So, okay. yeah. Beautiful. Let's jump quickly into basic ergonomics 101. In general, ladies and gentlemen, get yourself an adjustable desk, if you can, adjustable height. You know, there's many in the market right now. So, in, in general, you want to you wanna be able to get up every 30 to 45 minutes, get up for a minute what do i do when i when i have to sit my job doesn't entail sitting a lot but when i do have to write papers or do something for a prolonged period of time i'll sit with a lumbar roll in my back i make sure my elbows are in 90 degrees you do not want to type with your elbows leaving your body because it will drag your thoracic spine forward and we want to avoid that you want to keep your head in alignment above your shoulders ears over your shoulders shoulders over elbows get a keyboard that comes to you if you can so that will prevent you from reaching forward the seat height should be as such that the hips are slightly above the knee so if i am working here in my office what i'll often do i'll just take a cushion and if I have to sit for a while, I'll sit a little higher up, so now my hips are slightly above my knees. Furthermore, what do I do? I get up, if I have to sit for a while, I make sure, what am I, what do I do? And again, you have to be assessed, guys, ladies and gentlemen. You need a mechanical assessment to make sure what I'm suggesting right now is suitable for you. Don't do it if you're not sure. This is what I do for myself. On daily basis, I make sure that my back is not stiff. I do it in the morning, I do it midday, I do it if I have to sit for a while. I get up, I make sure I have not developed any stiffness in my back. Stiffness is often the first signs the body is giving you that a mechanical problem is around the corner. That's as far as my lower back. And I can do it either standing or just jump on my bed here and I can do it in lying. I make sure that my back isn't stiff. I also love to go on my phone and text and do some emails in this position. I play with my kids on the, on the carpet in this position at the end of the day. I have a half an hour drive home. I enjoy doing this position for prevention. For my neck particularly, I love what works for me, retractions of the neck. You know, I'm moving my head straight back and I also go into extension of my neck and I add this little overpressure at the end. These are, to me, important mechanical forces that basically, if you think about it, they are opposing what we do all day, right? On daily basis, we bend forward about 3,500 times a day, average human. And then we age forward, right? Look at mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. We age stuck in this position. So introduction of motions in the opposite direction was a brilliant discovery, uh, later on supported by research, that Robin McKenzie made, especially if the pain is starting to centralize as you're doing it. So if you have sciatica and you bend backwards and the sciatica is starting to move out of your leg into the back, it is a very good thing the public is not aware of. Centralization is the movement of the pain to a more central location. Centralization of pain that occurs as you exercise is a good sign. So I always try to make sure my patients understand what centralization is, and they don't just rush to stretch it. Derek, we're going to touch upon, I know there was a question, a lot of questions about why I, why I X'd out these stretches. Some people got... Got a bunch of questions. Why these were X'd out in the book? 
and uh, you know we can we can get into it in a second but these these often make people feel good they don't fix the problem so ergonomics again quick summary make sure you have an adjustable high desk if you can stand and sit throughout the day you don't have to stand all day you don't have to sit all day alternate get a keyboard that comes to you keep the elbows in 90 degrees make sure your hips are slightly above your knees looking straight at the top of the monitor and you have yourself a good setup to work from home or from the office. Perfect. Yeah, another, so just to, to kind of add to this now, um, in the webinar after you kind of went through these kind of ways you can set yourself up for success, you demonstrated specifically a couple of movements sitting and on against the wall that we just, that people just had so many questions about. So I thought it was really important to revisit a couple of those and really um, just go through the queuing again, because again, I think you had, I think I have a feeling what happened was you had a ton of people doing them along with you during, during the webinar. So if you want to run through a couple of those again, I know one was against the wall, that wall posture um, imprint drill was, was great. Yeah. We had the wall alignment. We had, you know, my, my three top recommendations. Uh, the first one I took from, from Robin McKenzie's book, The Slouch Over Correct, I call it zero to 100%. Uh, basically, sitting on a chair, sitting on a chair, we were all told to sit straight, right? And, and, and after five minutes when we were young, we all just collapsed. So going into the extreme of the good posture and then letting go, doing this throughout the day, do 10 repetitions, five, six sets a day of this. Just learn to move your body from the extreme of the good to the bad. The bad or the rest period is normal. We're supposed to hang out here for a little bit, then go back up. The secret is don't sit here for a prolonged period of time. That's what's creating what's called creep or load on the ligaments within the vertebrae that when you get up afterwards and you say, all I did was I took a piece of paper out of the printer and my back went out. Well, what did you do before that? If you sat like so for a prolonged period of time, the structures within our spine are more prone to derange or move out of place. So sitting is one. The second one was thoracic extension. And thoracic extension is one of my favorite one. You just need a chair. I'll use my bar stool here. It doesn't have to be a bar stool. You need a chair that hits you at about mid-back. You sit on it, you hold your elbows parallel together and you lift your elbows to the ceiling nice and gently. You exhale as you move into this position. You do 10, 15 repetitions here. You slide your buttock forward. You do another 10 or 15 repetitions here. You may feel a little pop in your back or a little uh, noise that happens as you do that. Don't be alarmed. That's often a, a good sensation. And the last one is the wall alignment, where you stand against the wall, you retract your head, and you flip your palms forward, and then you let go. You always do on and off, on and off. You go there, and you let go. In the book, we show it also against a wall. You open up, and you let go. You do repetitions of this throughout the day, and that will teach you to gauge as you age where should I be in space? The important thing is we do not want to age stuck forward. There's, there's a plethora of issues when a person gets stuck forward as they age. We want to maintain good alignment. Elegant posture is key as you're reaching your 70s, 80s, 90s, etc. Even when you're young, posture looks good. Posture looks good. It, it transmits confidence. When someone walks into a meeting like so, no one's going to pay attention to them. It just doesn't look good. So whether you're a professional or you're a business person, you want to work on your posture. And so these few exercises in the book hopefully will help you uh, maintain good posture as you age. That's great, Doc. You have another, another question that was asked specifically about you know, exercises and movements was um, your, your thoughts regarding like formal resistance training regarding you know, core strength and strengthening your back and surrounding structures. What are your thoughts there? Do you have any favorite exercises, forms of resistance? I think um, the people who ask just want a kind of a general overview. I'm a big fan of, and if, if, you know, if you've seen the gyms in the past 10 years, a lot of the gyms have cleaned the machines out and are doing a lot of body weight. I'm a big fan of body weight. I'm a big fan of functional fitness as opposed to, 
you know, as opposed to lying into a, uh, a leg press machine and pressing on a metallic platform to work on your legs, I enjoy providing my clients with functional fitness, meaning instead of move, moving, you know, a metallic platform, sit on a chair and get up 10 to 15 times. When this becomes easy to do, do it, you know, two or three sets throughout the day. You want to reach, you want to be able to press on Mother Earth and get up, you know, as you age. You don't want to have issues getting up, so strengthen yourself functionally. When this becomes easy, take two water bottles, hold on to some dumbbells. Uh, definitely strengthen the whole body, but try to strengthen it in a functional manner. What do you have to do as you age? Getting in and out of pants, literally, the balance, the process of getting in and out, um, getting out of a chair, getting out of a car, sitting and standing off a toilet. These are the things that I wrote about in the book that are important for the public to be aware of because we all have to have a roadmap on how do we want to look when we reach our 70s, 80s, and 90s. So majority of people are not going to be bodybuilders. If you love bodybuilding, the gym is a great place for you. But there's so much you can do at home. There's so much you can do with simple things, not complicated things. And that's the main motto here. Yeah, do you, um, someone asked on Facebook, if you have any more examples of movements that you do, that you do with patients, maybe that translate into ev like functional everyday movement patterns, like what other functional exercise? Would you, I mean, sitting and standing is great. You know, what, what else? Um, so as human beings, you know, especially as we get older, our, 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 our vision becomes more narrow. So activating peripheral vision, doing things that are involved, looking straight ahead and paying attention to things on your periphery. Uh, single leg stand when you brush your teeth. This is something when you reach your 70s or 80s, ask your mom, dad, grandma, grandpa to stand on one leg, you'll see that they can't. These are things you can incorporate during the day that are easy to do. They help you as you get older. I also love walking barefoot on the grass, on the deep sand. Here we're on Miami Beach. It's very easy to ask patients to go walk on the beach. Not everyone can do it. But if you can get yourself out of your shoes, connect back to the ground, and just use your feet the way they were supposed to. Did you guys ever think why we moved away from, you know, 30 years ago, everyone bought orthotics, and now if you look at the runners, they're, they're using these ugly five-finger shoes that have no support because research shows our feet needs to move. We have muscles, ligaments, bones that have to move. And a lot of the time, the shoes restrict the natural foot motion. So try to get yourself out of the shoes. Try to be outside. Be, you know, as opposed to being indoors, try to be outside. Get fresh air. Move, especially now, post-pandemic, where so many people were sitting at home. It is the best time to go to the park and use your body weight as the best machine to train. Great. I think that's great advice. Yeah. What about from a cardiovascular standpoint? A lot of people asking the best type of cardiovascular activity for someone who frequently experiences back pain or maybe someone who, you know, is getting older and wants to prevent it from happening. What are your thoughts there? Um, again, the, if you sit all day, spinning is not going to be the best form of exercise for you. Although a lot of people bought spinning bike, without to mention the company during the pandemic, uh, people have discovered, you know, and here I have I have a bike here in my office, but again, I don't sit a lot. So if I want to, you know, I get a great workout, I also stand when I do it. I, whatever you can do that's functional. I love walk, jog. I like elliptical. I, you know, anything, walking is key. We have to walk. We need to break the walking throughout the day. If you cannot do it in one hit, break it throughout the, throughout the day. Um, anything that maintains upright posture. If you're sitting on a bike, keep upright posture. Personally, I don't like recumbent bikes where you sit and there's a back support. You'll see people put their iPad or their phone and as they're biking, slowly their posture starts to leak into this position. They end up sitting here and when you see them getting up, they're stuck forward. I would rather people do more functional training aerobically versus you know, recumbent bike, or I'm, I'm also not a big fan of the rowing machine. Again, it's a good cardio machine, and if you stand a lot, no problem. But most people sit a lot, and so if you sit a lot, I would avoid recumbent bike, and I would avoid the rowing machine. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I, I guess people wanted to check all the major, you know, boxes with regarding exercise because the 
another question regarding exercise was uh, flexibility training. You mentioned earlier, you know, you had some stretches in the book that you do not recommend people do repetitively, but there were quite a few people who suffer from back pain on the webinar who said, what stretches can I do that might not um, cause back pain? I know it's probably hard for you to answer, not knowing the condition those people have, but what are some of the things you've seen work well for, for patients, some stretches and some mobility techniques maybe? So if someone calls me and say, I just arrived in, uh, in Italy and I took my luggage uh, out of the conveyor belt and my back is out. Yoav, I'm giving you a million dollars. What should I do to get myself? It's now 10 days. I'm going to be here in Italy. The first thing, the first stretch, if you want to call it. And again, you have to be assessed first. But the emergency panic procedure, if my sister, which is, by the way, my older sister, Shelly, it's her birthday today, so happy birthday. If she calls me and says, my back is out, I just did something, I'm gardening, or I lifted something, lay on your stomach. First thing, prop on your elbows. Hang here, hang here for a few minutes, hang here for a few minutes. If it's too painful, go back down. Again, you have to be assessed to make sure this is for you but often slowly starting to extend your spine might be the right answer for most people. Going back to what you asked me as far as the stretching that I, that I X'd out in the book that, that riled up a few people. Look guys, these stretches are the most common stretches that people do when they have back pain. That's the truth. We bend forward to touch the toes. We like to go into, everyone loves the child's pose position, you know, getting into this position and stretching. People love to take their knees to the chest. This feels good, knees side to side. The question is, or if you have, if you have buttock pain, what we call the piriformis muscle stretch, the figure four stretch, all these might be beneficial. But the reason I X them out in the book is, I see patients on daily basis who tell me, these are the stretches I'm doing. Well, why are you here? Well, that's also what my therapist told me to do. Have you ever tried to go in the opposite direction? What do you mean the opposite? No, no, no. I was told this is very bad for you. This is very bad for you. This, you know, this hurts. Okay. Have you gone to a mechanical specialist or mechanical therapist that have moved you multiple times to see hurt doesn't mean harm? Right? So if we move 3,500 times a day in this direction, of course this is going to hurt and this will hurt when people do it and they haven't been assessed and haven't been taught how to do it. So what I want the audience to take away from this question is often, often, not always, your answer lies in movement. Now, if something makes you feel good, and you stretch your back on your kitchen counter and you bend forward in the shower and yet you are living with pain and you're doing those stretches on daily basis and the pain is still there affecting your life or your quality of life, you owe to yourself a mechanical assessment that will find a directional preference that will restore the mechanics of your spine and often you'll see the pain disappearing. Awesome. Hope people are taking notes here. A lot of good info, Dr. Yov. Um, so I'm going to change directions a little bit now just because we only have about five minutes left. It's okay if we go a few minutes over. But um, another topic or, or sub area that we had a lot of questions fall under during the webinar was regarding lumbar supports. I know you're obviously being a you know, McKenzie faculty. You're very uh, avid believer in McKenzie lumbar supports. So we had questions ranging from, you know, what is a lumbar support to how they're used? Um, and, and what they do for people and even, you know, how do I choose a lumbar support? So I know, you know, you, you've worked with these things a lot. If you can speak to that a little bit. Sure. So first of all, um, there's a new signature line that came out of New Zealand being manufactured in New Zealand called the McKenzie, uh, signature roles. There's a variety of them. OPTP makes a variety of roles. These are the roles. There's different kinds, right? So there's there's ones that for the skinny people that anything you introduce, they call early compliance or anything you introduce that's too much, they're going to hurt. So I, I tell patients, listen, buy two of them. They're 20, 25 bucks. It's not a big investment. You know, often, often you can just play around with 
and, 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 and figure out what works best for you. I also recommend for patients to get uh, bolsters for their sofa. So if you don't want to have a lumbar roll sitting there, uh, you know, in general, you can always, the, the important thing to remember is this. You need, in general, you need to maintain the S curvature of the spine. If we bend, again, the belly button is here. If 3,500 times a day we bend forward, then we come home and slouch, whether watch TV in bed or sit with poor postures, it makes sense that the lower back will be stiff, right? So people get up, they hold their back, and they push that lower back off and forward. If you are one of these people that benefit from, uh, from standing, walking, you feel better when you're on the move, you feel you know, worse when you're sitting still. I'll show two different rolls that I have here. You know, original McKenzie rolls. This is an early compliance, really thin one that some people just need to sit. For In my case, it doesn't do really anything. It's not pushing my lower back forward. There's a standard roll. Basically, what you need to do is sit all the way back with your buttock all the way back, bend forward, insert the roll to the point where you cannot push it any further down and then lean back into it. Now what the roll does, it, it prevents me from slouching. I can easily sit, maintain good posture, but even so, after half an hour, 45 minutes, I'll get up, I'll move around, I'll do something else, and when I get back to sitting, I'll, I'll introduce the roll again. Guys, most cars have it. If you bought a car in the past 10 years, there's a, dr there's a button in the driver's seat, you probably have it, that inflates the lower back. The lower back support, the lumbar support is critical in most cases. So get yourself one or two McKenzie rolls, you can get them on optp.com, and, and find the one that when you sit for a prolonged period of time, it helps you when you transition from sitting to standing, it, it helps you avoid that mechanical stiffness as you're moving from a sitting position to a standing position. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Dr. I think that's really helpful for people who are considering making, you know, the investment into a lumbar roll, but we're completely familiar with how they work or what they do. But um, yeah, that, that kind of covers it. So, and, and honestly, we're kind of right at the 45 minute mark at this point. I think you just got through all the audience fielded questions here from Facebook and Zoom. One thing before we go, everyone just wanted to, I just think it's appropriate to uh, highlight Dr. Yoav's book one more time here, Aging Without Aching. So I'm gonna share the screen and just show you where it's at on optp.com. If you are a healthcare fitness professional, make sure you register as a professional to get discounts uh, you know, throughout the website. And, uh, but you, we've had nothing but great feedback from everyone who's purchased this book so far. And uh, we're you know, really excited about the book and about collaborating with Dr. Yoav. So Dr. Yoav, I just wanna ask you if you got any closing remarks here before we wrap things up. Um, just move guys, just keep moving. You know, try to try to realize your body in the past few years has really gone through a major sedentary period. So go for a walk, spend time outside. Um, think of functional fitness. Think of how you want to look when you're in your 70s and 80s. Work on it right now. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, anything I can do to assist you, very easy to find me. Um, and I'll do my best to, to answer your questions. Perfect. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for attending. Those of you who are on Facebook and Zoom, we actually had a, a really good turnout of individuals. This is great. I think, um, you know, got some good feedback from people saying they really appreciated the, the commentary and, and help and insight. So, um, yeah, everyone, thank you very much for attending again. Stay tuned. Um, you know, again, OPTP, you know, we're doing our Pro Talks webinars every month. So if you're on our email list, you'll Always receive notif notifications of those. Make sure you check out Dr. Yoav's book, Aging Without Aching, optp.com. And if you, um, uh, Dr. Yoav, one more thing real quick here. There were people who were asking, what's the easiest way to find a uh, McKenzie therapist? Do you, uh, you go to the Mc Google McKenzie Institute USA. It's M-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E, McKenzie Institute USA. You'll see, find a provider, you put your zip code. And, uh, and you'll see usually within 10 to 25 miles, there's usually someone around you. Perfect. Cool. 
All right. Well, thanks, Dr. Yo. We appreciate everything. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we will we'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us.